Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, when Wild Kingdom aired in the 1960s and 70s, many of the episodes documented wildlife research efforts. Marlon and Jim accompanied scientists all over the world to observe animals and their natural behaviors. Some of the techniques you'll see in tonight's episodes are no longer necessary by today's standards, but the work is still just as important. Wild Kingdom took viewers to the far corners of the world and cultivated an appreciation for animals and their habitats. Marlon and Jim showed us the importance of preserving the natural world, not just for animals, but for our very own quality of life. And that's good news for all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. In the Wild Kingdom, where death is swift, life depends on a design for survival. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by the company with coverage for everyone, Mutual of Omaha. From Chicago's famed Lincoln Park Zoo, here is Marlon Perkins to lead our investigation of designs for survival in the Wild Kingdom. Hello. I'm glad you could join us on Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. You know, almost all animals are designed for survival. This little lion cub is no exception. He has several ways of defending himself. In case of danger, he might try to just run away from it. Or he might uh, just crouch down on the grass, hoping that danger wouldn't see him and pass him on by. Some animals insist on carrying their hiding places right along with them. Box tortoises do that, like the one there on the tabletop. He has, has his head and feet out now, but when I come close to him, he's going to pull them in and hide in his own shell. Watch. Have you ever seen a box tortoise? Hmm? You watch what happens here. That box tortoise will just close right up as soon as we come in close to it. And uh, you can have fun with a box tortoise. You've never seen one before, because uh, African is your original home. And box tortoises come from North America. But he's a pretty interesting Oh, little lion cub. Come back up on the table. Here we are. You want to try and bite through there? Ah! <laughs> Some other uh, turtles have still a secondary means of defense, and uh, that is a matter of very strong odor. I'm going to get one from Jim over here. Jim, hand me that little old stink pot. We'll see what happens when the lion comes in contact with him, and see if there's any difference at all in his reaction to the box tortoise and the little stink pot turtle. Pretty strong odor, huh? Well, I guess you could tell that the little lion cub didn't care much about the uh, odor of that uh, little musk turtle. It's still, it's still ruffled by it. Now let's go into the laboratory where Jim Fowler is setting up an experiment with another turtle with even a more violent means of defense. Well, how is he, Jim? Ready to go? Yeah, he, he's ready to go all right, Marlon. In fact, he's convinced me that he isn't fooling around. Uh, I don't suppose he is. You have to keep out of range there. You know, he's got good armor, but he also has an excellent way of defending himself. Uh, the speed of that strike is almost faster than I can follow. And actually, the power in that beak is amazing. I think we can show that and listen to this sound when we amplify it on that speaker. He's a rough, tough customer. Look, oh, he bit that right smack into. Strong jaws. Well, it's a very effective defense mechanism. But turtles, uh, in one form or another, have come down through the ages for over a hundred million years. Not changed very much. 
Now, I suppose it's because of the effectiveness of their armor. Many other animals have armor plate, too. Many insects, lots of animals that live in the sea, and even some mammals. I'm going to show you a mammal that has excellent armor, but first I'm going to get rid of a little old sassy puss here. There you go. And in here, Jim, is a nine-banded armadillo. See if I can get a hold of him before he starts running around here. Don't let the turtle get on him. This armadillo uh, is called nine-banded because of these nine bands of bony scales embedded right in the skin itself. That's not like fingernail, then, huh? No, just on the outside portion, inside of that, there's actual bone. And if you'll notice how flexible this is, See, he can move all his, all his whole armor is flexible. And this is so he can go running along on the ground. Unlike turtles, he needs to have flexibility in his movements because he's mostly a burrowing animal. And he goes digging down into the ground. And then any animal trying to follow him is confronted with good solid armor plate. Let's see if we can demonstrate that right here, putting him in the cage with the little lion cubs. He was afraid of who? Oh, he caught it right in the face. <laughs> Poor little Sam's getting the worst end of this deal, Marlon. I don't think he likes that very well. <laughs> no, I think he's learning a little bit about protection, though. <laughs> oh, Jim, I think he's about had it. He needs a rest over in the bed. Come on, little Sam. Come on. <laughs> so far, we, all the armored animals we've seen have had shield-like armors to protect them against the teeth or claws of animals. There's another armored animal that has dangerous weapons for armor. Let me demonstrate. We're going to need some uh, brooms on this one, Jim. You better get one and back me up here. And uh, you keep him from coming out the front. I'll try and get him over in that corner because they can be quite kind of rough and tough. This is the African porcupine. And uh, they have the, the largest of the quills of the porcupine. And the, sometimes they rattle their, their tails and always back towards you. You see how they can actually back in and stump their feet. When they vibrate their tails like this, they sometimes, the loose ones, are actually dislodged and thrown out slightly, but they can't shoot them out of their body like most people think. Now, if I move in close enough to him, he's going to back into me, and I'm going to try and protect myself with this broom. Let's put it up again. Yeah. You can see how they can go sideways or backwards in a hurry. Jim, I'd like to show you why these quills now are so dangerous with this chamois skin back here. Here, just pull one of them out. Now just jab it right into this piece of skin here. My goodness, Marvin. Hangs right on, doesn't it? In fact, that's really hard to pull out. Yes, it is. The reason for that is because there are microscopic barbs all along the tip of the, of the quill. And they're there for a good reason, to hold in to the skin of animals. Mm -hmm. And they have a tendency, actually, to work their way clear on through. And there have been several instances where the quills of American porcupines have emerged on the other side of the arm. Well, that's a very good way for an animal to get infected, too. Yes. You know, this, there's no doubt about it. This is one of the most effective armors that I know of. We've noticed how some animals escape their enemies by simply running away from them, and how others use their protective armor to save their lives. Still another very interesting device is for those animals that use the bluffing technique. 
I think my choice for the America's greatest bluffer is the hognose snake. But Jim, I'm going to have to have a hand to set this tray up on top of the table. Let's be a little gentle here so we don't disturb him too much. Just underneath the burlap is a hognose snake. I'm going to roll this back. In fact, we have two of them there. I'm going to make some passes at them and see if I can get them to go into their little act here. Now they, I am simulating an attack on these snakes. I'll touch them gently here as though some animal is going to get after them. A lot of people think these snakes are poisonous and uh, they do sometimes spread a hood and hiss. Listen to that hissing. Mark. Yes, he is hissing nicely. And if I can get them to uh, maybe have a little attack here. Now you're going to see a very interesting technique. The technique of feigning death. Wow, that, that guy's really convincing himself. He's Isn't dead. he, though? Look how he rolls over and over here. Mouth open, tongue out, just playing dead like a dead snake. This one seems to be pretty dead. Let's turn him over. <laughs> see, when you turn him this one over, Jim, see, he wants to go belly up. Because he's convinced that the position of the dead snake is belly up. You know, I wonder just how effective this protection is. Well, who wants an old dead snake lying around? <laughs> Actually, right. I think it may be helpful because if, if you're attacking a snake and then you see he's dead, you don't continue attacking him. Yeah, that's, that's right. Jim, have you got that next experiment set up? I have it right over here. <clears throat> have you got him in there? Well, I, I had it here a minute ago. I don't see it. <laughs> Do you see anything in there? No? Oh, I'm beginning to see some movement now. Ah, here he is. Is this what you had in mind, Jim? Yeah, that's the one. You yeah. put him in there. I was beginning to wonder. <laughs> this is a fine big boa constrictor from South America who blended very nicely with his surroundings when he was in his natural habitat setting. And almost all snakes blend well with their sur surroundings, don't they, Jim? Say, have you got a uh, bag there we can put him in? Yes, I've got one right handy. Mm, he wants to crawl. Whoa, he's a big one, isn't yes, he? Yes, he is. You know, almost all animals have some kind of camouflage, some way of uh, blending in with their surroundings. I like to explain camouflage, but Jim, maybe you'd like to stand over here about 10 feet so you can get the full effect. Here's a duck decoy that we've painted solidly, one color all over. When we set him down in his natural habitat setting, then the intensity of light from overhead makes the top of his back very bright in color, or very light in color, while the sides of his body are darker. That gives him a three-dimensional effect, and he stands out quite markedly in this natural habitat setting. But nature protects its own animals by Having a counter shading where the top of the back is usually darker than the sides. And when that animal then is in a natural habitat setting, the intensity of light above is counteracted by the darkness of the animal and it becomes solidly one color all over and therefore blends much better with its surroundings. The next time you're making observations of animals in the wild state, maybe you'll notice that most of them are counter shaded like this fawn deer. Notice the darker color of his back and the lighter color of his underside. In addition to this counter shading, the white spots on his sides blend in with the shadows and the sunlight of the forest floor. This is known as disruptive coloration. We've been talking about how animals defend themselves. Some of them simply run away and hope that the animal chasing them can't catch them. Others hide, hoping the animal will pass them by. But you know, danger has a way of catching up with all of us. And eventually, every animal must at some time make a stand. And when he does, he must use his weapons of defense. One of the most formidable weapons of defense is the horn. When you put two tons of weight and a stubborn disposition behind a horn of great strength, 
then you can see why the rhinoceros is one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. One of the most common weapons for self-defense is the claw. And no animal in the wild kingdom uses these more effectively than the giant anteater, like this baby that Jim has over here. They also have a very handy tail, Marlin. Yeah. I noticed when I was in British Guiana that when an anteater lies down on the forest floor, see if I can get him down, this tail is hinged right over his body like mm -hmm. this. Oh, and it becomes, right it becomes a very good camouflage. And also, it's a protection against the elements. Mm -hmm. It also can keep mosquitoes from biting you. Mm -hmm. Here's a full-grown anteater in this pen, about six feet long. Just where did you get him, Jim? Well, I think I can show you on this map back here. I caught him right here in British Guiana, near the base of the Kanaku mountain range. And by the way, this is an area of open savanna that's completely surrounded by very heavy tropical rainforest. It's almost impossible to get close enough to an anteater in the forest. And I'd been looking for weeks before I found one out in the open. His weapons are his claws. They're saber-like and can cut a man to ribbons or kill his enemy, the jaguar. Although he can't see very well, he scented danger while we were still a long way off. Without a jeep, I would have never caught up to him before he escaped into the forest. The trick is to get close enough to get a lasso around those front legs without him turning and slashing you with his vicious claws. Blindfolding him, calmed him down. When I lifted him into the jeep and realized that there was 150 pounds of muscle behind those claws, I knew that he was well designed for survival. Jim, that was a most exciting capture. And I noticed that you did a good job of avoiding those dangerous claws. <laughs> I haven't shown you my scars yet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But these really are very well designed for survival. They are indeed. Back to Papa, baby. Yeah. Right. Jim, to me, the most intriguing weapon in the whole wild kingdom is venom. Mm -hmm. And of all the venoms, the most highly specialized is that of the spitting cobra. that actually sprays his venom out into the eyes of his enemies. I'm going to demonstrate that, but I'm going to need a little help. I'd like to show you just exactly how this works with this diagrammatic chart, this one being the head of any cobra. The venom gland is here, and the duct leading to the fang itself. Uh, this is all greatly enlarged so that you can see it more clearly. Now, when he squirts his liquid poison and squeezes on this gland, it flows through the duct right down through the tooth and is ejected right straight downward, uh, which would be right into the deepest part of the bite. If he were, try to, were to try to squirt his venom, it would not go forward, would, but, but downward right into his own lower jaw. By contrast, here's the diagrammatic drawing of the head of a spitting cobra, 
which is similar except for the very highly specialized fang which allows the venom to go straight forward just like a little squirt gun. Now he aims this and shoots at a distance of five or six feet and aims at the eyes of the animals that may be bothering him. And you know very good and well that if any of that venom got in their eyes, they would be blinded in a very short time. Yeah, very quickly. So in order to protect ourselves, we're going to have to wear clear masks over our faces. Well, here's your mask, Jim. Try it on. Does it fit all right? I'm going to make sure it fits. Well, now let's get the visor down to protect our eyes, then clear the deck for action. I think we move this down just a little ways, Jim. Then uh, the snake sticks down below. And I've got a Ringall, South African oh. spitting cobra in this box. Get him out here where we can see him. And then I'll like see if I can get him to spray. He's certainly alert, isn't he? Yeah, he's in a good mood today, Marlon. Now, Jim, he's following your action. And uh, he's spitting already. And so if you'll move back slightly and stand still, but be sure and back me up. Gladly. And then I'll attract his attention to me and present my face to him. Well, he can get you from there. Boy, he got you right across the eyes that time, Marlon. He's spraying nicely, isn't he? He sure is. Oh, yes, right. they're across my whole face. Oh, yes, right across my whole face. <laughs> You're going to need a towel when he's through. <laughs> well, Jim, yes. this shows you that, that these snakes have this specialized method of defending themselves by spraying their venom into the eyes of animals that bother them. And uh, the animals in Africa would be any of the big animals, particularly lions. And if a lioness, for example, got this in her eyes, in about uh, a day, both of her eyes would just hang out like, like loose sacks. Hmm. They'd be completely disintegrated. And so that would be a great tragedy. But I think a greater tragedy would be if she had cubs back in a den. Yes, we would. And uh, that reminds me, we have lion cubs in our uh, zoo nursery, and they're going to need a lot of attention. So if you'll go over and roll their incubator out here, I'll put Mr. Cobra away. Okay, you sure you don't need any help? Well, maybe not. Are they coming, Jim? Oh, they're fine. But they're getting a little hungry, I think. Why don't you go out and warm up their bottle then and All we'll right. feed them. You know, food in the stomach is mighty important for these little fellows. And without someone to provide for them, they'd be in trouble. Isn't it interesting, Jim, that lions with their great ability to defend themselves are actually losing the battle for survival? Yeah, but I think it's a real shame. I think it's a shame yeah. too. They've had those same abilities to, to protect themselves for hundreds of thousands of years, and yet their range is much smaller today than it was just a few hundred years ago. But so it seems with many animals. Protective devices that have been effective for millions and millions of years now seem to be out of date. Many animals are losing their battle with man. They are being killed out, their ranges are being reduced in size, and every day we must travel a little bit farther to find the wild kingdom.